Okay, chapter 10, China. When we talk about China, oh, these were the people who almost did, but they didn't. Almost did what? Almost took over the whole globe, almost overspread the whole globe, almost became the top peoples on earth, the most advanced scientifically and culturally. They were on the verge of it. Right knocking on the door, but they got so far and they stopped. And a lot of what we're talking about come Wednesday week, why they didn't get any farther than they did, why they stopped. The standard view is to blame their philosophers, but we'll get to that. Now, I do want you to learn some of these names, particularly, I mean, we've already talked about the Han Dynasty, but the Tang and the Song, I hope one of now, I know your book mentions the Sui. I'm not going to ask you to learn the Sui dynasty's name, but the, uh, your book does talk about them. The um, Tang is actually, that's, that can be pronounced Tang or Tazun. Uh, and these are dynasties, right? Yeah, these are dynasties, yeah. Anyway, the Sui dynasty started off fairly strong. Their big accomplishment was building the Grand Canal that joins the Yellow River with the Yangtze. Now, weirdly enough, we have a river called the Yellow River right nearby here, but it's not as big as the one in China. And this canal helped join North China to South China. The canal is still in service, still in operation. Um, Grand Canal joined two of China's main rivers. But the Sui dynasty became very domineering and very uh, difficult to get along with, so the Chinese people rebelled. And for two generations, there was no strong dynasty. Then came the Tang dynasty. The Tang dynasty was to rule China for 300 years. They were very energetic and very um, hard working, uh, hard energetic, hard working thing. Militarily, they conquered Tibet. They put Korea to tribute. They never did conquer Japan. In fact, uh, Japan was destined to not be defeated in a war until the United States defeated in the mid-1940s, about 1945. But uh, they, they could not conquer Japan. They did uh, hold on to Vietnam, and under them, China became the undisputed master of the far eastern part of the world. While Japan was not conquered, Japan was strongly influenced by, and they copied a lot of, uh, of China under the Tang. But they had a few problems, like all people have. They became corrupt, and after a while, the people of China became so upset that some Chinese local rulers began to rule without any regard for the central government. And this condition, uh, well, reminds me of something that happened in our own country where the, we had some states, particularly in the South, who said, you know, if we don't like a law Congress passes, we're just not going to obey it. We have a right to nullify any law passed by Congress. And the four-year bloody civil war convinced everybody that, no, you can't do it. But in China, some of the local rulers began to disobey or not even bother obey the government and central government under the Tang. Um, as the Tang dynasty became more corrupt, they were eventually overthrown and a new dynasty, the Song, came into existence. Now, folk, I have a fascination with the Song dynasty because uh, in my way of thinking, they're exactly what a bunch of rulers or a group of rulers should not be. What was wrong with them? Well, they patronized the arts, which uh, I'd say more power to them. Again, if you think of the word song, you know, song is a, a song is an art. You know, think of the word song. They patronized the arts, but they had the attitude that all oh, warfare is dirty and nasty, which it is, and we don't want to fight. 
So under them, the military remained weak. Well, they lost a bit. Now, for several years, folk, I would see a car parked in a park in a faculty lot and set free to bet. I don't see that car anymore. Either its owner got another job or its owner traded in cars and never did transfer the sign, whatever. Tibet is now under the control of China once again, thanks to communists, and they're led by a man known as the Dalai Lama, and the United States will have nothing to do with the Dalai Lama because we don't want to offend China. So Tibet still remains against their will, held on to China. But in the case of the Song, the Song was, um, the Tibet was able to free itself thanks to the lack of military interest that the uh, Song had. had. Um, in other words, to me, the Song is a typical liberal dynasty. Let's keep the money rolling, let's patronize the arts, let's look at the finer things of life, the softer things of life, and war, oh, I, we don't want to talk about that. And guess what? War overtook them. The song was conquered by the Mongolians and the Genghis Khan and folk. If you read about it in detail like I have, Genghis Khan knew that China had millions of people. And he was somewhat hesitant to go into China, but when he went in, the Chinese simply were not prepared for an army like these wild men were. And again, folk, you have a classic case, and then this time, it was a case where the civilized greatly, greatly outnumbered the uncivilized. And the uncivilized won in short order. Why? The civilized could not get themselves grouped together to fight. The Chinese general poisoned himself to commit suicide because he knew that he could never get the emperor interested enough to give them the money he needed to, to get an army together. Um, China has been conquered several times throughout its history of barbarians. It wasn't just the Mongolians, but there was a time when the Manchu came in, the Manchurians came in and conquered. Um, of course, then the Mongolians, and other times through, throughout their history when the nomadic barbaric dynasty came from the fringes and conquered China. They've just simply had a tendency to uh, fall prey to uh, to people who um, their civilization is not as far advanced as theirs are. Somehow, sometimes civilization makes people soft and weak and not want to join the army and not want to fight and not want to defend themselves. Anyway, to make a long story short, the Song Dynasty was overthrown and the new dynasty took over called the Yuan Dynasty or the um, Mongol Dynasty. Um, Y-U-A-N. Now, As was the case with other people, so I've already mentioned, China underwent, well, they underwent periods of down, downhill, and uh, they had a religious conflict. Confucianism was threatened by Daoism and Buddhism, both of which seemed to be more spiritual religions than Confucianism. Daoism, Buddhism, well, as was in the case of India, Confucianism made some adaptations. It began to appear to be more spiritual. And as a result, Confucianism in the long run triumphed. Now, Buddhism had a problem in that it was considered a foreign religion, and the Chinese people looked on themselves, any of our ideas is better than anyone else's. So uh, they tended to dislike foreign religions including Christianity. Christ, by the way, there were Christian missionaries that came from about 100 days CE all down through the ages, and they've made very little headway in China, again, partly because Christianity was definitely a foreign religion, even more so than Buddhism. However, if we'll jump fast forward to 1949, and China then embraced a foreign philosophy, namely communism. Um, it was as foreign as Christianity was, but nevertheless, they embraced it, and the result was millions of them starved to death. Anyway, um, Ch 
China underwent a uh, period of um, turmoil in which Confucianism triumphed. Just as was the case of India, the original religion came out on top only after it made a few adjustments. It realized, I guess when I say it realized, they, they got together meetings and said, where are we going wrong? What's wrong with our presentation? So they made themselves more spiritual and they got the people back on their side. Now, all right, equal opportunity, civil service, folk, for the last eight or nine years, I've always kind of had fun with this. About that time, we had a different department head than we have now. Now, our department head told us at a meeting we had went to in August, you can say anything you want to in your classes. I don't care what you say. Now, course, believe me, I try hard to be careful what I say. But I said something right here at this part of the lesson that somebody went right straight to the apartment head after class and told my man, eventually figured out who it was. It was somebody who had only attended that day and hardly ever attended class anyway. All right, here's what I said. Now, we're talking about the civil service exams. In China, it got to where the civil service exams were heavily slanted towards Confucianism. In order to pass, you had to be a Confucian. They occasionally threw in a few Buddhist questions, but it was all slanted towards Confucianism. All right, and here's what I said. In America, today, 21st century America, our college tests are slanted. I'm not talking about the exams you take for a regular professor, I'm talking about the national teacher exam or the graduate record exam to get into graduate school, those two in particular. They're slanted towards the left. If any of you don't know what I'm talking about, you will. If you're taking one of these tests, and it seems like one of these answers, choices, they're all choice tests, by the way. One of the choices appears to be more leftist than the other. You might do well to pick the one that's most liberal. The most liberal, the most leftist. Now, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, I mean, just like I did that class, and even the department knew, you're welcome to disagree right now. I don't care. I've taken those tests. I'm here. Go ahead. I mean that's true. Like in like it's 100% true in classes like political science, but it's also the opposite in like classes like economics, where it's more slanted to the right side. It just depends on a lot the, depends on the team. But I'm pointing out if you look at the overall picture, I'm talking national tests, national exams, not not the ones that the individual teacher gives. That depends on the teacher. But national tests have had for many many years a strong tendency. And at Duke University, there are 50 some professors, history professors. Probably 50 history, and every history professor there is a liberal Democrat. If you don't yet know what I'm talking, and a lot of people begin to wonder, I mean, there's a movie which I have a copy of, the title of God's Not Dead would have been lawsuit after lawsuit, about professors who strongly discriminate against people of faith. This, folk, it's, it's there, it's in the records. And uh, some of these lawsuits have been ruled, the courts have actually ruled in favor of the people of faith, and in some of them, they're pending. Uh, but which shows obvious anti, particularly in, in our country, anti-Christian bias, but also anti-bias against any kind of religion, whatever, in favor of atheism and atheistic worldview. All right, having said my piece, it still goes on. All right. The Chinese civil service exams were designed to give an equal chance for everybody to advance, even though your book has to admit it didn't do it really well because there were no public schools. So what did the chance did your ordinary person have? Well, if a kid grew up in poverty, but some educated person happened to see this kid and say, hey, I think this kid shows promise, convince the parents, hey, let me tutor him. A poor person here and there every once in a long while could advance, and occasionally one did, but it was rare. Since only the wealthy could afford the tutors, this who wound up filling all the government positions, with very few exceptions. Yeah, the wealthy. The wealthy filled the government positions, the ordinary people were left out. And also, your book mentions there was a lot of cheating going on in the exams, and of course this is a typical bit of human nature to uh, try to excel by cheating. Um, 
I try my best to keep it down, even though I will say on a personal note, someone very close to me got caught cheating one time and it hurt me somewhat. And I guess maybe that's one reason I try my best to make sure your opportunities to do so are as, are as curtailed as I possibly can, as you all well know. Our class ends in five minutes. Um, anyway, but uh, cheating was a factor. Uh, favoritism, uh, all this was a factor, but at least the idea was there that you could, um, a few people here and there did start at the bottom in poverty, and if they got to the right tutor, the right person took an interest in them, um, they rose up. Now, I want to say this, folks, about equality. My son and I got most got into a discussion with it because of a situation that happened here in Georgia where all of you think know a very, very extremely good football player was caught accepting money, which is breaking a rule that has been on the books for more than 100 years. He said, I think the rule is stupid. I said, okay, uh, I want to tell you why it's in the books. It was originally put in the books about 150 years ago because the rich saw they could not compete with poor people because the poor outnumbered the rich by about two or three hundred to one. So guess what? If you get a team of rich versus poor, the poor people are going to win every time. So what they did, they made a rule that professional players were not allowed to compete. This was designed where the rich could play their own games with the poor not being able to, because the poor could not afford the equipment, particularly like polo, the poor could not afford the horses. That's why the rule is in the books, and it's been in the books for 100 years. So having said that, in China, same thing. Suppose you had a ratio of about 200 poor to one rich. If they would have educated everybody, guess who'd have wound up and put everybody on a level, level playing field? Guess who'd have wound up filling all the civil service positions? Most likely the poor. Same with athletics. Can anybody in here name a rich person who got to the top in the world of sports? I can name some poor. Joe Lewis, Willie Mays, Ted Williams, he was an orphan boy. Babe Ruth, his father kicked him out of the house because he was incorrigible. But he nevertheless grew up in poverty. Um, Lou Gehrig, Bob Cousy. I mean, to name some, that's off the top of my head. Almost every professional athlete grew up in poverty. With maybe a few, hardly did they even come from the middle class. Never, almost never from the rich. Again, Take America, a nation of poor people, a nation of outcasts, Europe's outcasts, Africa's outcasts, Asia's outcasts, put them together, made for a great nation. If you could have just simply convinced the Chinese if you really want to be equal, train these poor people, and you can become the greatest nation the world has ever seen. You can plant colonies on the moon and Mars within a few generations. They couldn't see at the time. Maybe now they do. All right, with that. I'll see you on Wednesday. Did you do attendance? I took attendance while I uh, uh, passed out your test. Yes, I took attendance. Uh, it's another MAC test, right? Is that what that is? What's that? The pass? The pass, all right. I mean, the pass is going to be a separate test, but you're taking it at the same time you take the other. And what's it on? It's on uh, compare, no, cause and effect. If this is the cause, what's the effect? If this is the cause, what's the effect? Anything in particular that we need to know? You should need to have known lots of stuff I've been hammering on, teaching about, from the beginning of class till now. I mean, there's things I've talked about over and over again, including things I mentioned in today's lesson.